and good evening. Welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, my name is Leslie Gordon, and it's, I've missed the last couple of public lectures, so it's good to be back here and see a lot of friendly and familiar faces. It's always my pleasure, before I introduce tonight's speakers, I want to make sure that you come back next month. It's going to be a really exciting uh, talk. I hope I am here as well. It's going to be about brown bears, sea otters, and seals in Katmai National Park in Alaska. So uh, do join us next month. There are some uh, flyers on the back table if you want to pick those up for next month, and do join us. Tonight we have a, a terrific lineup of five scientists. It's rare that we have more than one speaker at a time. But what we're going to do is all focus on the variety of science and the kinds of questions that you can answer by using a particular instrument, some of our um, more fun and fancy toys. Um, our first speaker tonight will be Leslie Hayden. She's a geologist, a geochemist, and she operates the scanning electron microscope and the microprobe here at USGSN at, at Stanford. And she'll be talking about what she does, and then four other research scientists will be talking about the collaboration among them and how that information is used. So our five speakers tonight are Leslie Hayden, I mentioned, Diane Moore, who is an earthquake geoscientist, Catherine Watts studies crustal magnetism and mineral resources, Marjorie Schultz studies uh, the origin and fate of soil organic matter, and Laura Stern uh, studies planetary ices and gas hydrates here on planet Earth as well. Um, if you'll do us a favor of holding your questions until after all speakers have presented what they want to show you, we'll, we'll stay as long as you need for questions. So I won't get up in between. You have to memorize these five people. Um, and our first speaker tonight is Leslie Hayden. Good evening. Thank you for coming. So the title of our talk tonight is Geology Up Close, Big Answers from Small Scale Observations. And we're going to be talking about the Scanning Electron Microscope, also known as the SEM. OK? OK. <clears throat> um, Leslie just mentioned, since we have five speakers to get through, if you please hold your questions till the end, we'll be happy to answer them. So I'm going to start things off. Um, I'm in the Volcano Science Center, and I run the SEM and Microprobe Lab here on campus. So, the scanning electron microscope. On the left is our instrument. It is a test scan Vega variable pressure SEM. It was installed about two and a half years ago to replace our old SEM, which had aged out of its useful working life. Um, a little overview of how an SEM works. At the top of the column, under vacuum, we generate an electron beam from a filament. And our instrument is a tungsten filament, which is not unlike a plain old tungsten filament in a light bulb that you may have had in your house before we all switched to environmental eco ones. Um, so it generates a beam of electrons that moves down the column. As it moves down the column, it interacts with lenses and mirrors and electromagnetic fields which focus the beam onto the sample. When it hits the sample surface, it interacts with it and it ejects electrons and x-rays and photons and other particles. And we have a series of detectors that take in those um, information from those particles and process it into something that we can use. So what are the advantages, or why do we need an SEM on campus versus like an optical microscope that you just have on your desktop? Well, the main reason is that we get much greater, uh, can work at much higher magnifications with an electron microscope, as you can see here. Um, we're going to use the term microns for scale a lot tonight. So there's 1,000 microns in, in a millimeter, if that helps you for reference. So when we talk about something being 50 microns, so you have an idea. And I think, uh, so like a human hair is 50 to 100 microns, just so you have a sense of scale. Not only can we work at much higher magnification, but using electron beam instead of a beam of light allows us to see things that we would never see with an optical microscope, even if we could work at those high magnifications. So I talked about um, we have a couple different kind of detectors. The first one is a secondary electron, or SE imaging. 
We use this technique when we want to look at structure and topography, morphology. It shows relief. Some of our other speakers will get more in detail about this, so I just want to introduce it. These are just a couple examples. We can see some submicron honeycomb structures in this image. These are microbes from uh, on lake sediments. We have some diatoms also in sediments. And this is um, some weathering you can see on the surface of a mineral grain. So these are the types of things when we want to look at structure and relief, we use secondary electrons. Our other detector is backscattered electrons, or BSE. This gives us information about chemical composition. It works on the premise that the higher the atomic number, so that the farther down it is on the periodic table, or the heavier it is, the brighter it looks in BSE. So here in this first image, this is a sanidine mineral grain from the Hayes Volcano in Alaska. These alternating bright and dark zones, these are barium rich. So you can see barium way down here. It's pretty heavy in terms of the periodic table. So it shows up brighter. And in the Volcano Science Center, what we can learn from this is we can see that this crystal underwent a series of heating or recharge events. We can even tell how long these events lasted and the time period in between heating events just by looking at the, um, the relative brightness and the width of these um, bright and dark bands. The middle image is a biotite mineral grain, and you can see around the edge. What it's doing is it's breaking down into its oxide components. The very bright white ones are magnetite or iron oxide, which is down here, and these darker gray ones are quartz, so SiO2, which is here. So the iron is heavier than the quartz, so it's going to show up much brighter. And this kind of um, texture shows us that this mineral experienced either uh, depressurization, so a rise to the surface, or a loss of volatiles, or both. So it's just the, an example of the kind of things we can learn from BSC. And this final image shows a couple different kinds of mica grains. They range from iron rich to sodium and, and magnesium. And what we can see is through their different orientations, it's evident that this rock has undergone a series of uh, deformation events during mountain building. So again, something that tells us about um, uh, big picture structural event that we can see very small scale um, using uh, chemical information. We also have a tool called EDS, Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. And this gives us information on the chemical composition. So if we have a rock and we don't know what the minerals in it are, we put it under the beam. This one has a couple different spectra on three mineral grains of different brightness. And it outputs this spectra. And from this, we can tell which mineral we're looking at. The advantages of EDS is that it's highly accurate, especially the new systems and the new detectors, the modern instruments. It can analyze almost the entire periodic table from boron to uranium. And if it has any limitations, it's that the detection limit is only about three to 5,000 parts per million. So it's not so good for trace elements, but it's really good if you have a rock and you just want to know what are the minerals in this rock. It's very quick. Another um, technique that we can use related to EDS is element mapping. So sometimes we want to know the chemical composition, and sometimes we want to know the spatial distribution of individual elements. So this is an example of some element maps. So the brighter the color, the more concentrated the element. We have individual maps on the right for iron, sulfur, uranium, and phosphorus. And what this project is, this is a USGS project that's looking at groundwater remediation. Um, for groundwater that's been contaminated by uranium, and they want to use iron to try and sequester the uranium. So here we can see the nice yellow uranium rind on the iron. Not only that, but where we have on this composite map, where we have red plus blue makes purple, we also see a sulfide rind that's also acting to further um, armor uh, the uranium onto the grain. So just here's an example, not only the technique, but the kind of projects that we're applying it towards. Um, here at the Menlo Park USGS. And the one final step beyond that we have is phase mapping. So the software is smart enough to not only tell you the um, spatial distribution of the elements, but it can also calculate for you what mineral phases you have and the relative abundance. So these, instead of this being an iron map, this is actually a map of a clinopyroxene mineral and an iron oxide mineral and a plagioclase mineral. And it also has the relative abundance. This can be useful. We use this when you look at experimental run products or real samples. It gives us information about the pressure and temperature conditions 
that a sample was at pre-eruption, knowing the um, relative abundance of minerals. We can also use it when we want to see what is the proportion of crystals versus melt in a sample. It tells us about the flow properties of that sample, and we can help us learn um, how much of a volcanic hazard that would pose to a surrounding area in case of an eruption. So there are a lot of other ways to apply this, but this is just an example of some of the ways that we use it in the Volcano Science Center. And now I'm going to turn it over to Diane. Good evening. Let's see if I can get this to work well for me. I'm also left-handed, and I have to use a right-handed mouse, so um, <laughs> this could be exciting. I work in the Rock Deformation Lab in the Earthquake Science Center, and we measure the physical properties and run experiments on fault zone materials and a variety of other mineral and rock types to help us understand how fault zones behave at the depths where earthquakes nucleate. And I use the SEM both to characterize the starting materials and also to examine the run products of the experiments to help us understand what was, what was actually happening to get the measurements that we made in the experiments. And today I'm going to focus on one study that uh, is coming out this year. It um, used granite cylinders. Uh, they were cylinders of granite that we were testing. They're one inch in diameter and they were cut into two pieces along a diagonal saw cut, so it creates a, uh, a fault, a laboratory fault zone. So in the experiments, the sample is placed in a jacketing material and other uh, parts of the sample assembly. It's placed in a pressure vessel, like this one here, and then during the, the experiment, we apply a confining pressure, and then for these shearing tests, a ram advances against the base of the sample assembly and it causes slip along the fault plane here. So the experiments I'm going to be describing were run at room temperature on room dry samples, but they were conducted at a, a very high confining pressure, 4,000 bars, 400 megapascals. And the samples failed in the uh, what is, what's called stick-slip events. It's a laboratory equivalent of an earthquake. And these stick-slip events, they are very short and rapid. Uh, it took place in about a third of a millisecond. The amount of offset was about uh, around an eighth of an inch. But in those events, the frictional heating along the fault plane during those slip events was great enough that we actually melted the granite along the fault. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you uh, two types of images of the melt textures. Um, and both of them are, are relative to the standard techniques. We'll be looking at the um, uh, backscatter electron images on a, uh, a slice, a vertical slice through the cylinder so that we can see the fault plane here. And then we'll be looking at secondary electron images of uh, the sample that was opened up. So we're looking down on the fault surface at the end. So on the left here, we're looking at a relatively um, uh, low magnification view of part of the fault plane here. The arrows here indicate that uh, offset was left lateral. All the black in these uh, backscattered electron images indicate epoxy made from the sectioning process. There is a, uh, a thin, you might be able to see this thin bright line up here, and it moves over to the other side and continues down this way. This was our fault plane, the saw cut surface where the melt formed. And what happened was that when the melt quenched and solidified, it basically glued itself to the, the fault planes on either side so that the sample, when it opened up, separated. It separated along the fractured rock, the fractured minerals uh, next to the fault plane rather than the, along the fault itself. And this slide on the right here shows a, a closer view of the, uh, of the fault plane. So the yellow bar here and in the next couple of uh, photos indicates the thickness of the melt layer. And we can see it's basically a solid line here. The boundary is just completely glued together when it, when it quenched. So the thickness of the, the melt layer here is about five microns translated to inches at the bottom here. But even in that very narrow band, we can see a lot of compositional zoning. 
with the backscatter electrons, as Leslie said, you get uh, chemical information. So this bright band in the middle here is iron rich, and it also has uh, other elements in it that indicate that it's derived from the mineral biotite melting. And we'll get to that again later on. And then you get to progressively darker bands here, a spot analysis with the EDS uh, system of some of this dark material shows that it's a mix of the two feldspars that are in the rock, the potassium feldspar and the plagioclase. And it also contains a certain amount of uh, quartz in it. So the melting points of the two feldspars are about 11 to 1200 degrees centigrade, whereas the melting point of quartz is rather higher at about 1600 degrees. Although if you, you very finely grind up a mineral, it will melt at a somewhat lower temperature. So um, the temperature, maximum temperature that was reached in the melt was perhaps at least 1500 degrees centigrade during this slip event. And we use the, uh, the temperature, the peak temperature, and also the average thickness of the melt layer in calculations of the energy budget during that slip event. So this slide here shows a, a couple of other interesting textures. In the photo on the left, this was the saw cut surface, and a little depression in the surface got filled with ground up mineral debris that basically got trapped in place as the melt went over. It's kind of sealing it off. And you can also see, again, this is the yellow band indicates the thickness of the layer. You can see a lot of compositional streaking here. It kind of indicates that we had laminar flow of the melt during the slip event. Over on the right, the, uh, the melt layer was, you can see very well-defined boundaries of it. In this location here, there were a lot of mineral fragments that were caught up in the melt. And these have very rather rounded outlines. This may be a product of kind of melting-induced wear on the grains. And these rounded shapes here are rather different from the very angular shapes of the just you know, broken up mineral fragments that weren't in contact with melt. Over here, this is the last of our backscattered images. So this was the saw cut surface again, and that this one has a biotite crystal that was right along the saw cut. Biotite's a hydrous mineral. It has water in its crystal structure. And when, these, uh, when the biotite melted, these hydrous minerals uh, melt at rel relatively low temperatures. This is about 700 degrees centigrade. When it melted, it not only generated uh, perhaps a water-rich melt, but it seems to have also separated out a vapor phase, all that water that was, that was uh, melting too. And it separated and apparently drove out whatever melt was here and pushed it out along the fault surface, so which is why we've got all these biotite-rich bands, zones within the melt uh, in the glass now that are nowhere near a biotite crystal. So all of these things, they quenched, and we have these voids left over. This must have been a rather uh, exciting time here because all of the, uh, the remaining material up here is all broken up and fragmented, and there are a lot of small gas bubbles up here as well. And this is where we change views now, going to secondary electron images, and we're going to be looking down on the surfaces of the fault. This is one of those images. The topography here that you see, these were the bits of mineral fragments that broke off from the upper, the other uh, granite block and got stuck to the glass on this piece here. This lower area here corresponds to, say, the cross-sectional view along the fault plane of one of these biotite crystals. And you can see all this streaking and lines and uh, extended things that kind of show that this was a slip direction during the, the motion, the stick slip event. And then this final stamp uh, slides here. Um, those void spaces, I mean, they, they remained open. And when the melt quenched, we get all these textures that look more like a Hawaiian lava field than something that was formed in a, a very high pressure experiment. So we've got ropey lava, we've got all these beautiful glass hairs, all these really lovely structures, 
in a high pressure sample. And I got very carried away taking photographs of these things. <laughs> and I compiled them all into a USGS open file report. If anyone is interested, I can give you the number and you can download it for yourself. So now I will turn over the podium to Catherine Watts. Okay, so now we've heard a little bit of background about the SEM, including secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, and energy dispersive spectra. And I'm going to be talking to you about a different and I'm going to be talking about a different technique, which is cathodoluminescence, or CL for short. Um, and this is something that some solids exhibit when their surfaces are bombarded with electrons. This causes a change in the electronic structure at the atomic scale, uh, which releases energy in the form of visible light. And with a special detector on our SEM, we can actually uh, see this phenomenon, and this allows us to see inside minerals uh, and other geologic materials. So if you take a look at the crystal at the bottom, we can see its surface, and then using the SEM and the CL technique, we can see down into the individual growth zoning uh, within this crystal. So going from the core to progressively younger rims, very much like tree rings. So with this tool, we can piece together complex geologic histories. There are many minerals that exhibit CL, so here are just a few examples of these CL images. Uh, diamond, which everyone will recognize that mineral. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite CL images. Uh, the researchers studying this diamond nicknamed this one Picasso's diamond because of its really intricate cubist uh, textures in the core. You can see it had a very complex history. Uh, researchers used diamonds like this one to better understand processes that we can't directly observe deep within the Earth. Uh, the one in the middle is, at the bottom, is a quartz crystal from a hydrothermal vein. So all of you have seen geodes. If you had your CL vision and CL goggles on, you could look down into those individual prismatic quartz crystals and see these really beautiful uh, growth zoning patterns going from the core to the rim. And the mineral on the right, maybe some of you have not heard of. This is zircon. It's a very important uh, mineral. This is an igneous uh, mineral, meaning that it forms or crystallizes from magma. And you can see, if you look at these crystals, that going from the core to the rim, we have this really rich archive uh, of information that we can then piece together processes that occurred in these magma chambers uh, to better understand uh, specific geologic processes. So now I'll talk to you a little more about zircon. So this is a zirconium silicate mineral. Uh, it's very common in rocks of the Earth's crust. Um, many of you have granite countertops. They undoubtedly have many of these zircon crystals in them, but they're too small to see with the naked eye. They're a little wider than the width of a human hair on average. Um, but even though they're very tiny, uh, they're very powerful and very important minerals uh, in many sub-disciplines of geology. Uh, and this one reason is that they incorporate uh, uranium when they crystallize. So this uranium gets locked into the crystal lattice and it decays over time. So it serves as this fixed clock that we can then date by radiometric techniques. Zircon also incorporates trace elements uh, and isotopes that allow us to fingerprint a rock's essentially DNA or unique geochemical makeup. Um, and zircon is also extremely robust physically uh, and chemically. So unlike some minerals that we have to worry about alteration that they may not record robust records that we can exploit, uh, zircon is one of the most physically and chemically resistant minerals on Earth. And in fact, it is the oldest piece of our planet we have is a zircon crystal. So this crystal on the bottom left is from the Jack Hills locality uh, in Western Australia. This individual crystal is 4.4 billion years old. It's one of the oldest pieces of our planet that we've yet found. Uh, and you can see going from the core to the rim of this, this is a color enhanced CL uh, image, this really complex history that it has. So I have a few projects currently that I'm working on that I'm using zircons and the CL technique uh, on the SCM. So one is in the Great Basin of Nevada. Um, here we have many extinct caldera systems, uh, which are exposed analogs of modern supervolcanoes like Yellowstone. Uh, however, in the Great Basin, these are extinct and they've all been tectonically dismembered by extensional faulting. So we can really see deep down into the guts of these things and better understand how they work. Um, in addition, uh, the Great Basin is the source of the second largest concentration of gold on Earth. Uh, these occur in Carlin-type deposits along trends, uh, some of which are coincident uh, with these large caldera structures. I have another project that I'm working on uh, in Mountain Pass, which is in the Mojave Desert in California. Uh, so some of you may not know this, but it's the largest rare earth element mine that we have in the U.S. Uh, it's one of the largest in the world. It was actually the first producing rare earth element mine in the world. It came online in the 
50s and 60s when these rarities were really important as color phosphors in the cathode ray tubes and color television. Since then, uh, the use of rarities has really ex exploded in our modern technology. Uh, they're in our cell phones, in our computers, batteries, uh, motors. Uh, they serve as really strong small magnets as well as phosphors uh, and many other uh, applications. This deposit is really geochemically unusual. It's hosted in these alkaline and carbonatite rocks uh, that are not well understood. So that's part of our ongoing research is to better understand how this one formed and where we might find uh, others like it. So I have another project in Pea Ridge uh, in southeast Missouri, uh, which was an iron mine uh, that was producing until uh, the late 90s. Uh, this is an iron oxide, copper gold, and iron oxide apatite affinity deposit, so-called IOCG, IOA type deposits. There are many other similar deposits uh, in this region in southeast Missouri. Um, this IOA in membrane in particular is important because it can have abundant uh, rare earths, and in particular heavy rare earths. Uh, this is one of the few heavy rare earth deposits in the U.S. So heavy rare earth meaning rare earths with a higher atomic number, which are chemically distinct and have different applications than light rare earths like we have at Mountain Pass, which have a lower atomic number and different uses. So what specifically, uh, what kinds of questions can I answer with zircon? So. Uh, on the left are SEM images, including backscatter electron images and then cathodoluminescent images uh, of the same grains. Um, what you'll see is these elongate blebs uh, in each of these crystals. These are actually tiny little bits of magma that were trapped in the zircon crystals as it grew. And then when the crystals uh, were erupted, for instance, in a volcanic eruption and quenched, uh, these quenched to glass. And we can now actually exploit these using high spatial resolution tools to measure concentrations of metals. Um, I can also date uh, the zircon crystals with radiometric techniques to determine the timing uh, and duration of magmatism and mineralization. And then I can use trace elements and isotopes uh, within these zircon crystals to determine the geochemical relationship uh, between host rocks and ore deposits. So all really fundamental questions uh, when trying to better understand these very economically important uh, mineral resources. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marjorie Schultz, and she'll tell you about some of her work uh, on the SEM. Good evening, and um, just thanks for being here. It's nice to see everybody here. And I'm actually in a different um, location. Okay, sorry. I have to open a different file here. And we're going to shift gears a little bit and come to the surface of the Earth. And what you're looking at here are two soil pits. Each pit is about 150 centimeters deep. It's about five feet. And um, we're going to be looking, what I'm using the SEM um, for right now is to study carbon in soils and where it's located and how it's located. And I think you can see, if you know anything about soils, that there's a lot of carbon at the top of this soil from Santa Cruz County. And the carbon up from Humboldt County goes much deeper. And if you know anything about California's precipitation, you know that there's a lot more rain in Humboldt County. And we think that that accounts for why it's deeper down there. The other thing I want to point out is that this soil in Santa Cruz has these beautiful modeling at depth, MOTT modeling. Um, the soil scientists here, we think this, um, this so the, both of these soils are about 120,000 years old. They're very old soils. They're very weathered. We think these are the, this modeling is due to um, root action at depth. Okay, so a little bit about carbon. How does the carbon get in the soil? You probably think about leaves falling down and decomposing. Well, that, that's one way. And on top of the soil, it gets bioturbated. Um, half of the carbon that is photosynthesized by plants, about half, it depends on the ecosystem and the kind of plant, it actually goes underground. And you might think, oh, it's making the roots, and that's part of it. But the other, um, a third of that carbon that goes underground that's not used as root material actually gets exuded out into the soil. It's one of the techniques that plants use to, uh, to extract nutrients. They put out organic acids and things like that, and they, they use that to dissolve things in the soil and extract them and bring them up. So that plants are actually putting a lot of carbon underground. It's not just all the stuff we see up above. And then one thing that... Um, 
we focus on this the shallow carbon has been studied quite a bit because of that's the area we use for agriculture but we know that roots go deep and that there is carbon here and when you when you look at this is a lot higher concentration of carbon but when you look for the uh, trying to count for all the carbon in this soil um, from 40 to 20, 200, 200 um, centimeters you have you have about a third of the carbon there the concentration isn't as high but this is a much larger volume of material so it's got a little bit of carbon and it does add up and um, why do we care about carbon in the soils well soils are a relatively large pool in this global carbon cycle here's the atmosphere um, and this is in pedograms of carbon per year these are huge pools but the soils themselves have almost three times as much carbon in them than the atmosphere does and um, right now the plants are fixing carbon photosynthesizing it and it ends up can be ending up in the soil but the soils are also de being degraded and and co2 is moving out into the atmosphere from the soils um, through climate change um, and as soils warm in certain areas of the world particularly the far north microbes process that that organic matter and, it, and their processing will increase as it warms up so this flux back into the atmosphere from the soil might become larger creating a, a more co2 in the atmosphere and therefore maybe feeding back to global warming and we really don't understand enough about what's going on in the carbon so that's what's driving this work I do we're using a lot of other techniques besides SEM but what I'm going to do is just show you what the SEM is is telling us um, in this study so can we get more carbon more soil organic matter that's SOM into the soils and keep it there um, we can grow plants to photosynthesize CO2 and there is there are groups of um, genetic micro uh, plant but geneticists trying to make plants with deeper roots that go deeper that can might be able to get the carbon deeper for us there's there's work doing on that um, but we really need to know what stabilizes that carbon in the soil that deep carbon and and we haven't really looked at it. so I'm going to be focusing on this this is my colleague um, Corey Lawrence this is some of the detailed sampling we've done on these um, and I, I do need to say that this is a uh, a big project there's there's a half a dozen or more people working on it it's not just all my work although I do the SEM <clears throat> and then this is this is our Santa Cruz soil from about 120 to 150 centimeters and I hope you can see that there's some little rootlets going down here and we're going to focus focus on some of what that deep carbon looks like in both Santa Cruz and in the Matoll soils but when you use the SEM to image carbon you need to keep in mind that um, you want to you want to look at something on the s on the surface of things, and the normal um, voltage that the SEM is used at is about 15 kilovolts, and this that's what this image was taken at, and you can see as you increase the voltage, the interaction what they call the interaction volume increases, and if you really want to look at something at the surface, you want a low voltage and it's not until the last couple of decades that we've been able to use low voltage and image image things and so if we look at this same sample in low voltage you can see here it's like a ghost you're seeing you're seeing through it because the interaction volume goes right through that thing but as when you lower the voltage you actually see oh my gosh it's it, it, what it is is it's a fungal hypha my, um, mycelial fan um, and it's attached to this aggregate this soil aggregate um, and you totally miss it in the high voltage and, and it's we're actually really small this is five microns here so your hair is about 70 microns so we're looking at something that's very small in the soil and but the other thing is by going back and forth you can see that this looks like one solid piece of a mineral but it's actually made of different grains so going using these different techniques can tell us different things so we're going to look at now this is the deep where the root channels used to go and you see this discoloration that's probably things that have been exuded into this clay matrix from the passage of these roots and here it is in a, a bigger chunk under the SEM and then here's the small the small root there's actually some root material left in here and you can see root headers and we're going to look in closer onto these root systems here now is another root 
going along this root channel. These are like fecal pellets, so there's one way we're getting uh, carbon in the deep soil. And we're going to focus in on this. This is actually turns out to be a biofilm. Here's the root channel. You can kind of get an idea that there's something there when you really focus in on it. Now this is 10 microns. We've got clay and we have these spaghetti-o looking things. Those are actually a kind of bacteria, a spiral bacteria called actinomyces. And then these straight things are fungal hyphae. Um, and you can see that these bacteria are sort of embedded in that, that clay. And when they're um, you've got the, so you've got this carbon m m matrix, the, bi the biology in the clay. Um, the clay minerals are really well known for absorbing lots of things. And so one of the things they think that keeps, the, the, well, the people where all of us are all studying it think that the, the clay minerals can actually hold on to that carbon and make it unavailable. So that's a way of maybe getting carbon to stick and stay around longer. And so by studying the, the um, interaction of this in the rooting zone, we get some insights as to what our chemistry we're doing on these bulk soils. Um, I just wanted to remind you that carbon is a very light mineral. So one of the other ways I can look at it is with backscatter, and we've seen a bunch of those images already. Uh, but all the other mineral elements that we tend to show up in soil are heavier. So carbon should show up as a darker color in the backscatter. And indeed it does. So here, now these are, ter these are the other shot, um, images were from Santa Cruz. These are Matol samples from well, Humboldt County, let's call them that. Here's the root, and you can see that there's like shadows here. And indeed, it is carbon. Here's the old rooting zone. This is now here, and you can see there's some kind of a biofilm there. Can you see that? And this one has sort of a, it has sort of a waxy look using this backscatter. This is all carbon coating this old rooting zone. So again, it's really giving us an image of what's going on there, rather than trying to chemically taking it apart. And just to convince you that that, that's, that, that really is carbon, I, I did some EDS. I had to convince myself. Again, this is a rooting zone. And you can see there's some shadows here. And um, you've seen a couple of these. Here's the carbon peak. And that's taken on one of these bright zones. Here's the carbon peak taken in, in one of these shadow zones. So indeed, this is a carbon coating on top of the, these clay minerals. And now I'm going to focus in here in the rooting zone. And you really get a sense that there was this root um, zone was filled with some kind of a mucilage that the root goes through and it's exuding things and it's creating. Um, people are starting to think that, that this is probably a way for the root to survive a little bit of drying when it's coated with mucilage and, th and things like that. And then as the root breaks down, this stuff breaks down. And um, here it, we're 20 microns. So these are really tiny clay minerals behind this, this carbon. And they're all sort of being coated in carbon and hopefully fixing that carbon. So it'll stick around a little longer. So the SEM really provides us a window into the nature of the organic matter and, and how they're interacting at depth. We can take them apart geochemically, but it's really nice to see how they are in relationship to one another. And while I'm looking at these things, I always run across strange things. And I wanted to show you a few of them, my, what I call my soil surprises. This is a root, you know, I'm following, following rooting zones and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is that thing? It's some kind of a bug. It's kind of big. It's, it, and I had to pass it around to some of my biology friends saying, what is this? Does anyone know out there? It, yeah? It's a testate amoeba. Now those amoebas that live in your pond water that, you know, we studied in grade school, when they live in the soil, they have to survive wetting and drying. And so they build themselves little armor. And um, it, I think these are silica, these little. So they've got themselves a little uh, you know, armor suit so they can survive in the soil. <laughs> One of the other things we did, and these are in the Santa Cruz soils, we have a lot of um, iron nodules. Iron nodules are pretty common in soils. They form in the soils usually from redox. And that's what we thought we had. These, this picture is just from a gopher mound after a rain, the rain washes all the dirt off and the, the um, 
the nodules remi- re- re- remain behind. And, and um, when we were doing our geochemical work, I wanted to show a picture of the inside of these. I would think I, I think I thought I'd see some really nice little crystals of iron oxide, and we could have a picture in our paper saying, "See, this is what they are." Well, I cracked one open, I put it on the SCM, and I was like, "Uh-oh, it doesn't look like I thought it would." And uh, <laughs> we all of them have these bubbly vesicles, and it's all iron oxide. And when you focus in on it, you can see there's fungal hyphae all over them. Um, can you see this? That's a, a really typical septa between two fungal um, hyphal walls, hyphae in here. This is all iron oxides. Um, here is now a real big enlargement. That's a half a micron there. And, and you can see that there's, you can just make out that there's tiny little crystals of something. It's iron oxides and it's carbon. I think these are iron oxides being precipitated by the fungi. They can do all sorts of interesting things, those fungus. And they're there in our soils, and we still don't know exactly why or what they're doing, but there they are. And it, this, this is a, a cross-section of one of the uh, young, uh, a small nodule. And here you can see the fungal hyphae, and it's bright because it has iron in it. So it's depositing iron oxide there, right there in the soil. These are the mineral grains here that it's cementing together. These, So it's an interesting structure and still a little bit of a mystery. And so the SEM really helps us understand how things are in relationship to each other on a really micro scale when you're dealing with really small things, clay minerals. And we can now see the carbon in the soil. And you can, by extension, say it's helping us to look at the micro microbiology and the micro ecosystem that's under our feet. There's a lot going on under there that we still don't know. <laughs> and so now I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Okay, so we're going to end tonight's talk with one final aspect of the SEM that we have here on campus. And that's the low temperature capability. So we can image special materials that need to be kept at very, very low temperatures, stable in the SEM while we're looking at them. And I'm going to focus on a particular class of compounds, gas hydrates, to talk about this. And just a quick show of hands. How many people have heard of gas hydrates, methane hydrate? A number of hands, great. How many people have actually seen one? <laughs> not, not, <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay, so first let's talk about what a gas hydrate is. Gas hydrates form on Earth when you have uh, water and a sufficient gas supply combining under uh, moderately low temperature and moderately high pressure conditions. And it forms a clathrate structure. It's an ice-like solid. Uh, but it's a cage, and you can see such a cage over on the right. It's a cage of water molecules here, enclosing what here is a methane molecule in the center. Most gas hydrates on Earth contain methane. That's the natural gas in, piped into many people's homes. And methane hydrate uh, stores a large amount of methane within it. So just, um, just for scale, if you brought a cubic inch or a cubic foot or meter of methane hydrate up from ocean sediments and brought it up to the tabletop and let it decompose, you would release 164 times that volume of methane gas at standard conditions. It's a lot of gas in there. So on Earth, they occur offshore in marine sediments underlying continental margins worldwide pretty much at depths beneath, uh, below three to 500 meters, and also onshore within and beneath permafrost. So this map shows the global inventory so far of gas hydrates. You can see all these diamonds and dots uh, showing um, either um, recovered or inferred gas hydrate. Inferred meaning it's from geophysical um, data, uh, as well as permafrost regions up here. And I just want to mention briefly that gas hydrates, they were first discovered in a laboratory in the early 1800s. And then in about the 1930s, uh, people noticed that they were clogging gas pipelines. And they were just thought of as an ice-like nuisance that, 
that created big blockages in pipelines. It wasn't until the 1960s that the first sample of natural hydrate was even found on Earth. So this map is really a work in progress as more and more localities get discovered. So just to illustrate how much gas is in this, this is some uh, laboratory hydrate. Hold on one sec. Okay, I'm recording now. In the room, it's not stable. So we're going to light it on fire. And it's going to decompose to gas plus ice. And we can light it on fire. And you can see it really sustains a very nice flame. Burning ice. <laughs> And then the ice is melting to water. This is actually on a screen. It's dripping down, which is why it's getting smaller here. OK, so they're important for a number of reasons. Uh, energy considerations, they, obviously, they, they store a lot of methane, makes them a potential energy resource. Uh, they have environment and climate is issues related with them. They often exist in nature near the limit uh, of their stability, and they're sensitive to changes in pressure and temperature. And release methane may affect oceanic and atmospheric chemistry. They also have a lot of interest for geologic or geotechnical hazards. They've been implicated in seafloor slope instability or submarine landslides. And as I mentioned, they can pose hazards to oil and gas drilling. Uh, and here's an example of an enormous plug of hydrate in a pipeline. I think this was a picture from a, a Brazil, Brazil, somewhere down in Brazil. So the USGS has what's called the USGS Gas Hydrate Project. It spans several science centers around the country. We partner with other federal agencies. Uh, outside uh, and al also research organizations, universities, um, and many uh, international partners. And our prime focus areas are studying the formation and distribution of gas hydrates in nature, their potential as an energy resource, and the interaction between uh, gas hydrate and the climate system. And we do this by uh, participating in field studies and drilling expeditions uh, to better understand gas hydrate sites and collecting geologic, geochemical, and geophysical data to better understand sites and also collecting samples. And we manage unique laboratories around the country where we can actually study these materials. Which brings us to our lab here in Menlo Park. So we make gas hydrates. Uh, my example I'm showing here is methane hydrate. We can make a number of different kinds of hydrates. We have special pressure vessels. And the technique that we, we developed was to make hydrate so that we can make the same, uh, the same type of sample over and over again that we use in physical property tests. That's a, an important uh, aspect of, of, of a sample material that you can, you can make a sample and use it in strength tests or electrical conductivity tests. And you know what it is you're measuring because it has the same grain characteristics. And we developed a technique where we make, we take a specific, um, a, a well-prepared ice, prepared in a certain way, mix it with high-pressure gas. And we can pretty much get the reaction to go overnight to forming a large stick of methane hydrates, polycrystalline and porous methane hydrate, shown here on the right. Our method also allows us to mix in sediments in different uh, distributions. We can do it a homogeneous mix or layer it. And we want to do this so that we can make tailored hydrate sediment aggregates for certain types of property tests, or to try to mimic textures from nature. So how do we look at these types of samples that you can see are just so easy to light on fire and uh, just want to decompose so easily? So we have a special system here in Menlo Park, uh, the cryogenic cryogenic uh, preparation and imaging stage. This is the cryogenic preparation stage on this uh, mounted onto the the uh, electron microscope. I take my samples out of liquid nitrogen. I can put it, I take a small piece, put it into the preparation chamber, cleave off a fresh fracture that's clean of condensation, and we put it straight into the SEM column where we can maintain temperatures down to minus 180 centigrade, which is minus 292 Fahrenheit, just for, uh, for scale. And at those temperatures, we can hold the hydrate stable for quite a while, under, depending on the vacuum conditions. So we have been able to use, we started looking, we started doing cryo-SEM in the early 2000s. Uh, so we've been doing this for a while now. When we started in the 2000s, there was only one other group in the world looking at gas hydrates. So many of the techniques that we use were actually developed here in Menlo Park. And since then, what we have learned from SEM is uh, how the reaction process proceeds, uh, what the grain characteristics are, uh, the size and shape of the actual grains within the samples, composition and distribution of other components in the in the samples, like sediments or where ice might be in them or contaminant phases, what samples from nature look like, 
uh, whether or not we can successfully mimic some of those textures. Um, and also looking at sediments that are incorporated with hydrates from nature. And of course, as similar to what Marjorie was talking about, we're always looking out for surprises as well. So let's talk about the reaction process briefly. We originally thought prior to getting a cryo stage here on campus that the, the reaction from ice to methane hydrate was a grain for grain transformation. And boy, were we wrong. So what we found was actually the reaction process starts on the, on the outset of the ice grains up here. So it starts, it's, it's like a mess of porous. It's spongy looking at first. Uh, but this is just a two micron scale. And then we develop these very small subgrains that continue to anneal during the synthesis of the hydrate to, to create these beautiful, fully formed methane hydrate crystals in the final texture. Uh, and here are some images of the final methane hydrate crystals. And uh, again, you can see a 10 micron scale here. And remembering that you know 50 to 80 microns is a human hair. So these are really small. Whoops. When we look at a sample uh, just in, in a lower magnification, we see a lot of porosity in them because there's originally all the space between the ice grains. Um, it looks even more porous here because there's some grains plucked out. But along those cavity surfaces, again, we see the beautiful crystalline formation here. Uh, in our old scanning electron microscope, it's higher vacuum that created this pitted look on the surface. We've also looked at other types of hydrates to make other hydrates like ethane hydrate, shown here. And uh, the box in this image is enlarged up here. Again, beautiful crystalline forms, 20 micron scale. Carbon dioxide hydrate, again, polycrystalline methane hydrate, uh, polycrystalline carbon dioxide hydrate. And these final two images of methane hydrate are with our newer test scan SEM here on campus. We have a low vacuum capability, we can actually keep a pressure within the chamber. So now I can look at samples for more like an hour and a half instead of 10 minutes before they change rapidly. This box here, I'm going to enlarge in the next picture. And there's just beautiful, two big, beautiful methane hydrate crystals here. Whoops, where'd the cursor go? There it is. And then the sample had some secondary growth. You can see as these little fingers of methane hydrate along here. So as I mentioned, we use SEM to look at uh, Basically, all of our samples that we use in physical property tests, just for as one example, um, we have an electrical conductivity apparatus in our laboratory. I'm not going to go into details, but the schematic of it is shown here. It's a large pressure vessel with a, well, in the very inside of it, we make our sample. And the test may run about a full month or so in duration from start to finish. And afterwards, we'll remove the sample, we'll quench it, remove the sample uh, to look at the final texture, uh, this upper Sorry. There we go. Oh, I lost the cursor up here. Oh. Well, the upper photo to the right shows uh, methane hydrate at about uh, 20 micron scale. And the bottom picture is methane hydrate plus a quartz sand mixture. So in our tests uh, that we do here, usually we start tests, um, first of all, with a pure, pure end member methane hydrate. And then we'll add in components one at a time to understand the effects on the properties. And I'm not sure why I lost the cursor up here, but we'll just make do. Hmm, I lost more than the cursor. OK. Uh, let's move on and talk about what some samples from nature look like. On the left here, the A and B on the left, maybe I got the cursor now. Yay, who knows what happened there. OK, this is, a, this is a sample recovered from a permafrost region in uh, northwest Canada. The hydrate here shows up as this dark gray material in between all of these larger sand grains, mostly quartz here. On the right is hydrate that we made in the lab to mimic the same texture. So the samples recovered from nature, they also incorporate some ice in them, um, ice that formed during the recovery of the sample. The samples that we make uh, are the pure methane hydrate, and that's what we test so that we don't have that ice contaminant phase, which very often changes the properties. Let's look at some marine hydrates. This is one material from uh, Cascadia margin off the coast of Vancouver. These are all small pods of methane hydrate here. 
has a nice smooth surface. But in the older SEM, uh, as I mentioned, it sublimates quickly. And we use that to our advantage to be able to get an idea of the 3D, more of a 3D visualization of how it formed within the sediment. And then as it continues to sublimate, we can see the, uh, how clay or silt particles align around all of these little pods and, and how, it, how it actually formed in that structure. And some other samples here. I'm going to show you a core from uh, off coast uh, India. Often the cores that are sent to me look black in my ma macroscopic view like this. The core is it's cut in half. It's in a pan of liquid nitrogen. That's why it's kind of blurry. There's a haze of nitrogen gas over it. Um, very often, methane hydrate just occurs disseminated within the sediments. Sometimes you can see veins or thin veins or pods or nodules, but very often it's just disseminated, and it's really hard to see just by, you know, with your eye like this. But as we go in, we can see, see it better with the SEM. Here's some thin little veins. This is a thin vein of methane hydrate here. This is all uh, marine sediment in here, a little pod of methane. And hydrate also is in between all of the little uh, marine sediment grains in, in the rest of this region. This sample was very surprising in that it also had these small cavities that were just lined with beautiful and very, very small crystals. I've never seen anything quite like this in the laboratory, uh, but we found this many times in this, uh, in this particular core and as well as some of the other cores from this expedition. So let's go in a little more closely and look at these. Here's a closer up view, again, 20 micron scale. And uh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> and you can see some of these beautiful little dodecahedral crystals, but they're beginning to degrade in the SEM column. I mentioned we're also interested in the sediments that often form with the hydrates or around the sediments. I'm going to use this one core to, to finish up here. This core also had some beautiful crystals along part of it in some open cavities. Uh, these two boxes here are enlarged at the right where you can get a better view of the crystals. Um, very often it's hard to distinguish or we want to make sure that we're actually looking at hydrate and not ice. So we use EDS and it either shows the carbon signal or it doesn't. This particular sample, it was greenish macroscopically. It had a lot of uh, biogenic material, little skeleton fragments and nanofossils, as well as volcanic ash and clays and silts. What was interesting about this sample is that it, uh, the hydrate sublimated very rapidly, about in 20 minutes. And as it sublimated, it revealed the beautiful structure within the marine sediments and the, uh, the little nanofossils were all embedded in it. So after the hydrate sublimated, we could see these beautiful diatom fragments and start looking more closely at sediments uh, that, that form with these hydrates. And in some cases, uh, oh, and then one section of the hydrate, these little sections up here, these very tiny little dark areas where the hydrate sublimated as well as from within the chamber of this 4M. What we also found in this, uh, in many places within this sample, if you look, whoop, here we go. If you look right here, you can see these little oval shapes. They're magnified as we go in closer and closer again. These are pyrite framboids. They're teeny little chrysolites of pyrite that agglomerate into these larger ovals. They look like raspberries, hence their name framboidal pyrite. I think framboise, raspberry in French. And here's a bigger view. And here's a bigger view. And then finally, what we do sometimes is we let the hydrate completely dissociate, dissociate and then we can separate and look at the, some of the, uh, the microfossils a little more clearly, such as here. We see some beautiful diatom, diatom fragments here, as well as uh, here's two more framboids. And leave you here with one final picture of a, of a diatom. There's the 50 mi milli, um, sorry, micron scale at the top. So that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you. As usual, I know you'll probably have lots of questions, and all five of our speakers are willing to answer your questions. Uh, a lot of you know the drill, that we've got a microphone in the center. We'd like you to, if you're at all able, to uh, walk up and use the center microphone so that not only that we can hear you in the room, but that it's recorded because we live stream and record these lectures online for other people to meet. So. Um, just a, a quick summary, in case you've already forgotten who our speakers are. Um, our first speaker was Leslie Hayden, um, and she told us about the scanning electron microscope, the SEM. It's this really powerful tool and how it works. And then we heard from Diane Moore, how she uses it in earthquake research to understand what happens in the fault zone. Uh, Laura was the last speaker, and she talked about studying the gas hydrates um, and their structure and properties. Uh, Catherine Watts talked about how we can uh, take individual crystals and learn about the history of how rocks form and ore deposits. And Marjorie Schultz talked about uh, soil formation and specifically carbon in soils. And so these are all really different areas of research, but all depend on the same uh, tool. Um, so, anybody have any questions? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead with your first question? Okay. Uh, well, actually, I have a couple of questions. One is on on the soil analysis. Um, uh, what kinds of soils actually have the most carbon in it, and is that correlated with the kinds of uh, 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 microbial life or the plant life that uh, uh, was in the soil? Actually, yes. The, um, you can tell the soil often um, by the ecosystem. There are certain soils that form under certain ecosystems. The soils that have the most carbon um, are permafrost soils where the carbon is frozen. You get the, the frozen um, mm -hmm. sphagnum and moss um, wetlands. And so the, that's why they're so concerned about the, the warming of the north, because the, it might, might release that carbon. Hmm. And we, there's many people on, um, looking at that. So wetland carbon, wetland soils tend to hold the carbon more. It, does, it, decay, it slows down the decay. OK, so can you replicate that, uh, say, in uh, other locations, uh, and maybe use that as a source of uh, carbon fixation? It, that's one idea. Or sequestration, yes. rather. Yeah. Um, okay. But I don't think we can make wetlands everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But, but the, there are a lot of people working on different techniques. One of the, there's a group locally in California, there's um, some UC Berkeley people who've been working on compost additions to soils and whether that will actually not only fertilize the soil but increase the carbon in the soil. And they've got some very interesting results hmm. okay. that they've been getting there. I have a second question in regards to the uh, methane hydrates. Uh, uh, with uh, pre presumptively with global warming, uh, maybe some of that uh, methane is going to be released actually, and uh, actually maybe uh, make uh, accelerate the process with the, because uh, methane's uh, also a a, war a, 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 a a climate change uh, gas. You know. You're right. It is a very potent greenhouse gas. Actually, though, it's not expected to be in any kind of a runaway, catastrophic manner. Uh, if methane hydrate is released from the ocean floor, there's not a lot that's actually going to make it through the entire column to make it to the atmosphere. Hmm. And there's also, with warming and uh, um, if, if sea level rises, it actually increases pressure on them. Oh, so there's okay. a little bit of a, it isn't the, the runaway scenario that some people have thought. Uh, okay. that, that's the current thinking. Um, okay. But it's also difficult to, an to analyze because it's hard to tell how much methane that does reach the atmosphere actually did come from methane hydrate as opposed to other sources. So it's, uh, it's a tricky question, and um, there, there's a lot of research currently going into that. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. You got to get paid for this? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's really amazing that we do, yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of questions also. The first is a technical one. How do you distinguish the backscatter electrons from the scattered electrons? So we have two different detectors, mm -hmm. and they're just set up um, in a certain geometry on the instrument, and so the different electrons come off at a different angle. What do you do? So is that your question? Yeah, that's okay, the question. Yeah. 
just the angles, the way yep, not, just not, the not position, the, not the yep, it's the way like they that. come okay. off the surface. And okay. yep. Another question about the rare earth elements. I had always been under the impression that most of our rare earth elements that are used industrially are obtained from China these days because we don't have enough in the United States. So I was so surprised to hear about your mentioning large amounts of it. Yes, that's absolutely correct. In fact, China supplies 95% of the world's rare earths, not only the U.S. Um, and rare earths are critical elements, meaning that they're essential for our modern technology and way of life, but also some that we do not have, currently have domestic sources that we're exploiting. So that's become a new push for the Mineral Resources Program to better understand these critical elements like rare earths. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, just a question about the faulting. And a lot of the different research and stuff that you folks are doing, I can, visual, I can pretty easily imagine the scaling up and how we see the impact. But I'm curious about the faulting of the stuff that you're observing there. And where does that, how does that scale up to stuff that we actually, that makes a difference, if you will? Well, that is a big, big problem, a big question, the scaling factor, because we're doing something at a microscopic scale or, you know, hand specimen scale. But <clears throat> among one of the things that they're doing is trying to look at kind of basically every scale from our laboratory measurements up and up. So people have been um, putting instruments in mines. There have been induced earthquakes in mines. And we have a, we have a sort of intermediate uh, lab here that, that has a, a meter, meter wide blocks that, uh, that also uh, kind of helps fill in the gaps. Um, there was a deep drilling project in, um, along the uh, San Andreas Fault, Seifad. And so they were putting seismometers down there. This is a place where you get repeating earthquakes, things that are very small, like ones and twos, and maybe minus ones and twos. So if you get close enough, you can record these very small earthquakes that you would not record up at the surface. So they're kind of bridging all these different scales so we can kind of link what we're doing a little more closely. This is like that and that and like that, and just kind of go up all the different scales oh, thank you. to an earthquake. My question is, uh, can you talk about potential industrial applications for gas uh, hydrates? Industrial applications. I'm thinking of um, storing g gas. Storing? Well, what has uh, been, um, what is currently underway in Japan is, for instance, manufacturing methane hydrate in the form of pellets as a form of safe storage and transport of natural gas. It's actually methane hydrate. It's a, it stores a lot of methane, and it's a lot safer than, than natural gas. Um, and it actually, and part of that bridges on something that we discovered in our lab has to do with an unusual way to stabilize methane hydrate at a reasonably warm temperatures with a special kind of a pressure dropping effect. And that's all being used in the, in the pelletization process. Um, so yes, that is actually, um, that, that is being looked into, and, and they've done a lot of work on this, in, in, at least in Japan. I'm not and sure about other countries. Possibly for hydrogen powered cars, perhaps? Perhaps I, I can't answer that. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure about that. Safer than gas cylinders, I think. Thank you. I also have, I also have a follow up question about gas hydrates. And uh, your map showed that there were a number of locations on land. Siberia, for example, uh, where uh, gas hydrates are found in permafrost, I believe. So they wouldn't be uh, covered by the comforting explanation that you gave about uh, the methane um, uh, being uh, reabsorbed into uh, ocean water if it is released from the ocean floor. Um, so what about the uh, terrestrial deposits? That, that's and a great question. It's too bad that there's probably no way of leaving them alone, uh, not exploding them, yeah. <laughs> uh, as one would like to do for fossil fuels, other yeah. fossil fuels. Well, well, I will say one nice thing about dissociating gas hydrate is that the byproduct is a very, very pure water. <laughs> there are, it's just methane and very pure water. but. Uh, uh, the permafrost hydrate, it's, it is more accessible, but probably about 98% of gas hydrate is in marine sediments rather than permafrost. The permafrost is just easier to access, uh, but it is not by, by any means the, the most abundance-wise. 
I have a, I have a question. Um, I'm seeing that the SEM produces these photos, like this, these one image photos. Is there, or maybe it's in the, in the works right now, something that would produce like a video of these photos, or to be able, would, is such a thing possible, do you think? Electron, scanning electron? Uh, in our video age. I don't know. Would there be any processes that you would want to observe in situ, for instance, well, happening? I was thinking with the granite. Processes that you need to There's one where you're pushing the two pieces of granite. You might want to see exactly what are the steps when it melts and all that stuff. Oh, you know, well, I mean, that requires pressure, so we can't put, you know, we can't put a huge load. That would be a whole nother. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't know. There are some issues with like photography because you can't really have uh, light on. Like we have a camera, but it's infrared. Mm -hmm. uh, visible light interferes with a lot of the detectors. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure um, how sort of a live <laughs> video would work. Um, but it's something. Maybe it's something of the future, an invention of the future. It's a great idea. Yeah. Phase <laughs> transformations. You can, you can get for phase transformation, you can't use it with the SEM, but there are people who have studied this sort of thing, looking at reactions, say, under a microscope while it's going on, and they can image that. But um, it would be very hard with a scanning electron microscope. It would be probably very impossible for us to, to actually see what we're um, you know, melting that granite in the experiment just because we can't do it. There are some options using like a synchrotron like they have at um, Argonne National Lab or even at Stanford, which is like that huge mile long, and you can generate x-rays that way. And there are ways that you can put something at high pressure and get a little window into it and see kind of what it's happening. Yeah, synchrotron, but we can't do that uh, with our technology. Yeah. Are there any more questions for our speakers tonight? Well, I'd like to thank all of you, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And please join us March 30th uh, to learn about bears and cat mai. Thank you. Good night.